What I learned when I was going through our blended family was that you had to be very intentional. Making those game nights for the family to sit around a table and to play a game always brought us together. It always helped us make memories. And sometimes it gets intense in blended families. And so to just take a break and to laugh as family was very healing. Hey, welcome. This is Family Life Blended, and I'm Ron Deal. This donor-supported podcast helps blended families and those who love them pursue the relationships that matter most. I'm so glad you've joined us on this journey. Welcome to episode number 82 it's all fun and games. But before we jump in, hey, more and more of you are giving to Family Life Blended. Your gratitude is overflowing into financial gifts. And I just wanted to stop and say thank you for that. We've received a few large gifts, but mostly a lot of $50, $25, even a $5 gift. It just means so much to us. Thank you for supporting this work. Most people don't realize just how dependent we are on little gifts like that. So if that's you, thank you. Did you ever play games as a kid? Board games, outside games, inside games with your family? What kind of emotions or memories did it create for you? I have a lot of great memories with my family. We played board games after dinner. We built lots of memories with my dad and my brothers playing baseball and basketball in the front yard, pool, even ping pong down in the basement. And of course, along with the fun and the thrill of competition came some agony and defeat every once in a while. Anger would break out and someone would lose control of themselves. Games just bring out all kinds of emotions in us. That's one reason, by the way, that play therapists use play as an avenue to reach the heart of children. Because play disarms us. It disarms our defenses. It opens us up to new possibilities. And it brings out emotions that are buried deep inside. Krista smith Larson uses games to help families process their emotions and their life circumstances. Ultimately, it's about making memories and connecting hearts. Krista smith Larson is a blended family mom who, for years, facilitated divorce care groups. And then she published a curriculum for teens of divorce that she wrote herself called The Journey, Divorce Through the Eyes of a Teen. She and her husband have led blended family groups, retreats, and seminars for many years. And now they produce games for families that help draw out conversations that need to be had about loss or about blended family transition. They do this in order to bring about hope and healing for kids and families. Now, let me just add, I'm really excited to tell you about these games. People ask us all the time, what do you have for children in blended families? Well, we have a booklet called Life in a Blender. And uh, my online video class, The Smart Step Family, has a bonus session for children. And now, well, this podcast is another tool because you're going to learn about a resource that you can use in your own home. But small groups can also use this as a tool in child care. If the adults are meeting and going through a small group discussion and the kids are having child care off to the side, you can utilize these games in the child care to give them an opportunity to process and think about and learn something about their blended family. Very excited for you to learn about these game opportunities. So here's my conversation with Krista smith Larson. Krista, did you play games with your family when you were a kid? Actually, we still do, which is right? kind of funny, yeah. We have an annual hearts tournament that we bring in 30 people every Christmas, and we have a traveling trophy and the whole bit. So oh, we still do, but I did when I goodness. grew up, too. <laughs> well, now I know why you have such a heart for games. <laughs> okay, so seriously, like every Christmas, your extended family comes and gets together. Yep, it's a big deal. A tournament with a trophy and everything. Yep, if anybody <laughs> plays hearts, it's we have six different tables. Sometimes we've gone as more as much as eight different tables and we all play and 
We have special rules, and it's quite the night. Okay. Do people end up in fights ever? <laughs> well, that... it gets very intense by the end. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it does. Gets really competitive. And isn't that the nature of games, especially with friends and family? It is. It takes you out of the element, and it gets you just focused on the game, and so the world around you just takes over. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, and it brings up all the emotions, too. Exactly. I mean, the competition kind of brings out the, you know, the <laughs> striving inside you to, to beat somebody else. Yep. Sometimes somebody's talking smack. My mom could talk smack. <laughs> Let me tell you, she was a gamer, and she would just totally get inside your head from across the table. What was her favorite game? Well, we played lots of games when I was growing up. There's a board game called Wahoo that not many people know. I it. They, never Trouble heard of it. is sort of a similar game to, and there's another game that we're playing these days called Jokers and Marbles, and it's sort of like. Oh, Wahoo. we just got that about oh, three months ago. Now that is a great game. Yeah, another name for it is Carbles. Yes. Because it's carbles with or cards with marbles. Yes. That is a great game. It really is a good game. So Wahoo was kind of the 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 deal family game, and we played it a lot. We did play cards, and we played outside games like you know baseball and basketball. I had a very sports oriented family childhood. That's always fun. And it is fun, and you know you build memories, and it connects you, and it also makes you mad at one another. <laughs> So sometimes you throw things at each other. My younger brother and I have had more than one occasion where we ended up in fights <laughs> over ping pong for crying out loud. Well, that can be a very intense sport. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about all this because you and your husband make games. Yes, we do. For families to play, specifically yep. blended families. You also do some stuff for kids who've gone through parental divorce. Okay, how'd you get started? Tell me the evolution of this. Well, it's kind of very, very weird. I um, have always been a divorce care leader at our church. This goes back 25 years now. Mm. And when I was going to be leading a divorce care group right before Christmas, I thought, I want to do something different than just going to the group and, and doing the lesson. So God woke me up at two in the morning and he said, here, try this. And I got out two pieces of cardboard, I glued them together, I sketched out a game, and that's kind of where it started. You know, I've learned the two in the morning things from God are the best. Yeah, it's best to be wide awake and listening. <laughs> you got to you gotta listen, you got to take action on those things. Yep. Just the other day I was telling somebody, if I ever wake up with a thought, I go with it. And I trust that that is totally from God. Okay, two in the morning, you started with a game. and. Yep. Who was it for? And what was At it that time, it was, it was the beginning, first stages of what I have now called the Slippery Slope, mm-hmm. which is a board game. And it just kind of, everybody starts with a grace card because God offers us mm-hmm. free grace. Mm-hmm. And then as you go around the board, um, you have either a feelings question or an action question. Um, and then they get to play the grace card if it gets to be a question they're uncomfortable with. Mm-hmm. So they get engaged real easily, and it worked very, very good for just something different to do instead of just talking and having a lesson for the night. Okay. And how many games do you have now that are available? I am up to 13. Wow. <laughs> And every year it adds one, so I keep on thinking up of new things to do. Okay, right now we are sitting, our listener doesn't realize this, we are sitting in Studio Z here in Little Rock where the Family Life Blended team works. And we're in the studio together, and you're from Minnesota. I am. But you're here in Little Rock for a play therapy conference. That is correct. Now, you know, one of the cool things about play therapy is somebody figured out at some point that kids can articulate thoughts and feelings. When I say kids... I'm including adults. That is very true. All right. Young adults, especially, and me, people my age, people, especially younger children, can articulate their emotions and get things out through play. It's the language of children. It's much more effective. It's a great therapeutic strategy to Mm -hmm. get inside their world through the back door, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so games falls under that category of play therapy. You're here this week to to have an exhibit at the play therapy conference. I am. All right. So help our listener understand, connect playing a game as a family and what it can do for the individuals and for the family as a unit. Well, what I learned when I was going through our blended family um, was that you had to be very intentional. Mm. Intentional, intentional. And so making those game nights for the family to sit around a table and to play a game um, always brought 
us together. It always helped us make memories. It always helped us laugh. And mm -hmm. sometimes it gets intense in blended families. And mm -hmm. so to just take a break and to laugh at the family was very healing. And then from there, I realized that um, I could do more than just play silly games. I could play intentional games. And so that's kind of the starting ball of where I went for making different intentional games to help them in two ways. Uh, one of them is just to identify feelings and then talk about the feelings. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing most recently I've been working with is building relationships. I think a lot of our kids nowadays uh, haven't learned the tools to build a relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I have games to help them talk about relationships, how they can make them better and open up a little bit and how to teach them to have social skills. Okay. So this is a way to get children to begin to talk mm -hmm. about stuff going on inside them. Correct. And sometimes kids will do that freely and openly. I've got one child out of my three, whatever he's thinking, you know it. All right. It's, it's coming open out. Open book. Open book. Other two, not so much. Like you'd have to find strategic moments. And usually I couldn't pull it out of them if I wanted to. It just sort of moments sort of created an, an environment where they felt safe to begin to talk and yep. might be driving in the car. I was going to say driving in a car or yeah. waiting for a pickup or, and then on the other hand, there are those usually the firstborn that are the people pleasers. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they mm -hmm. need to get out of that element of thinking they have to please to sit down, play a game, and you see a different side to them, which is really stuff that they're feeling all along. They're just not safe saying it. Mm -hmm. You got 13 games. Give me an example of how one of them how it works, and how it helps open up a child. I would say I sell a lot of the games to counseling centers, mm -hmm. a lot of them to churches, family yeah. ministries, and that kind of thing. And so it makes them feel comfortable. Um, one of them is called Scenarios. And you literally, I have 72 different scenarios What it, uh, that would consist of different blended family situations, whether it be uh, you're with your stepsister and she's going to go to her parents' house, her mm -hmm. biological mom's house, and you're staying. How does that make you feel? Mm -hmm. If I bring up the situations, it draws them to compare and think about their life, and then it triggers a feeling. Mm -hmm. And when you trigger that feeling, you know you've hit a spot, and they start to open up and share. Okay, so put yourself into those shoes. First of all, tell us a little bit about your family, and then here's the question I'm going for. So if something like that were to happen in your household, you're playing a game and it triggers something and it opens up something in a child, what do you do as the parent or in some cases the step parent? So before we get there, back up and tell us a little bit about your family and the journey you guys went on. All right, I'd love to. So we go back way back 25 years ago. I went through a divorce. Mm -hmm. My children were four and six and was really... Uh, nervous about being a single parent home, mm -hmm. um, had little kids. So I was very intentional at that time to go through divorce care and make sure I brought healing to myself, healing to my kids. And then when I got time to do some dating, I got nervous about the blended family thing. Mm -hmm. And I, for a long time, just stayed back. I thought, mm -hmm. I'm know that I can be a good parent to two kids. When I add some kids to it, it makes me nervous that I'm not going to be able to serve them all well. And so it took me some time. Mm -hmm. I went to a lot of different blended family groups to try to hear their stories and to get more confidence in myself. And so then my husband and I, John, we married in 1999, okay. and he had two children as well. And they were younger than mine. So we had... 99, we married. We had four children then, and they were from the ages of 10 down to four. Hmm. So we jumped into it. One of the criteria that I had before we got married was that we would go to a blended family retreat, and my husband thought that was the most ridiculous thing in the world because for him, he really thought that we could be an intact family. Mm -hmm. He did not get mm -hmm. the fact that it would be different. That's something we talk about a lot on this program. And sometimes that fantasy is just so big that well, we're not we're not going to be different. We're, yep. we're repairing what we've lost. And so we're going to go back to being an intact family. Exactly. And, and was that your experience? Yep. I kind of had read a lot and I knew that it was going to be an adjustment. 
he really thought, get us all under the same household and it's going to be no different than what he was used to. And it pretty much blew up in his face. <laughs> and I bit my tongue instead of saying, told you so. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> but that was when we decided to search out for help mm. and there wasn't much out there. Mm -hmm. And so we started a group ourselves. Just thought we'd get some other people together yeah. and we would do a, a small group and learn together. Hmm. And actually, that's when we sought you out. It hmm. was that long ago. I was going to say, when did we first meet? Was it? What? Well, when did you start the Step Family book, Smart well, Step Family? Yeah, the, the Smart Step Family, the first edition came out in 2002. Okay. So we had you in. It was funny. I was looking at my emails just the other day, and I seen emails from you and me back to 2003. Wow. Okay. Yes, and we brought you right. in 2003. Mm -hmm. And I seen that you were just starting out. Mm -hmm. And I remember so clearly you came to a little podunk town in Elk River, Minnesota. And I remember saying, my claim to fame is going to be, I knew Ron Deal when. <laughs> <laughs> That is funny. Because you weren't out very much at that time. Yeah. I was just trying to do whatever I could, um, speaking wherever I could. And there were you We know, got a deal on you, let me tell you. <laughs> I, I'll never forget being in Elk River. I can actually sort of see it in my head. Sometimes I forget places. But um, I can see it there. And I remember somebody coming up to me going, it, it's a suburb of the Twin Cities. Yep. And somebody asked me, why Why are you here and not in the Twin Cities, like the big city? You know? <laughs> and I go, well, you know, I go where I'm invited. And they invited me and you didn't. So here, <laughs> so here we are. Now, aren't you glad that you're here? It was. It was a smaller church. And yeah, it mm -hmm. was very exciting for our church. Okay. And so that event, plus you were getting people together, which we are big fans of here at yep. Family Life Blended, just get people together and start studying now there's all kinds of material not when you guys started that is very true but now there's lots of material that groups can study and video based resources and whatnot and so that did that help you and your oh, journey oh it helped a ton mm. it gave us confidence for one for two we were able to draw more of the community in so mm -hmm. it became more of a community group instead of just a church group right. and i would just encourage anybody out there you don't have to be successfully blended mm. to start a group. Right. We learned as doing a group, we learned more than even probably attending a group. Mm. It made us be more intentional to be prepared and to talk things through. And so you don't need to think you have it all put together in order to lead a group. Just get people together and talk about life, be vulnerable, and mm. you'll find connections made and stories shared and blessings given. Amen. I will say it again. I've said it on this podcast before, but I will say it again. I really think a lot of the power that creates change for families is community, being with other people. You exactly. pray for each other. You encourage each other. When you're down, they sort of lift you up. The content, the material, the resources that we produce are really helpful. They give you some guidance. But what really makes it take root in your life is community. Yep. So if you don't have it, you got to find it, and sometimes you got to create it all by yourself. Yep, and don't be scared to do it. So, yep. you guys jumped in, you guys did that. Um, you're moving forward with your kids. Did you have some typical struggles that step families have? I would say blending a family was the most difficult thing mm. a family could do. It was tough. It was really tough. Mm. Um, we went through, I believe it was in your book or somebody else's book about seven years. Is mm -hmm. that somewhere? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's seven fair. years. So I always had that trigger in the back of my mind that that would be the mark to look for. And we were coming up on six and not even close to thinking it mm -hmm. was going to click. Mm. And all of a sudden, it was, and I don't think it's a magical year for everybody. Right. It's just an average. Mm -hmm. But for us, it was like mm. the page turned mm. and things started to click. Things started to work together. We were very intentional. That was one of the things I think I picked up from all of your teachings and all of the different books that I read is to be very intentional, to make memories, to make big things out of little things. Mm -hmm. 
And we did a lot of that, a lot of celebrating small wins. We took a vacation together every year mm -hmm. just to be able to do life for one full week to 10 days and out of the atmosphere of home, which was really important too. So it was, it was very, very tough in the beginning. You said a little while ago, playing games was one of the ways you brought a little smile in the midst of the hard going on in your family. Was that something you discovered kind of early on or was, you know, was it a few years in? No, you... for us, actually, it was more like survival yeah. early on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and then as we started to relax a little bit and the kids started to get along a little bit, mm -hmm. we started to bring out the games. We were very slow and intentional about forcing relationships together. Mm -hmm. We kind of eased into it. Mm -hmm. And then as things started to mold with the kids, we felt it was more safe to start bringing some outside okay. activities in. I got to just pause for our listener because there is a ton of wisdom in what you just said. You know I'm a big fan of slow and easy and intentional. Oh, the crock pot. The, yep. That's yep. the crock pot strategy, right? But what you guys did is you also didn't try to push it in terms of games as a way of you know, finding togetherness, yep. but you were listening to your family, you were pacing with the family. And then as things began to get a little easier, then you could bring out that option. Uh, there's so much wisdom in what you just said. I don't want anybody listening to think, okay, games is our <laughs> magic wand. You know, it's the thing we're going to wave and it's going to make everything Absolutely happen. Absolutely not. It's just another tool. Yeah. It's another tool. That brings us back to full circle, this question about what kinds of things did you see happening in your kids and in yourself and in the family unit as you guys just were playing games and maybe even some of the more intentional games as it evolved over time? You know, in the beginning, you were just playing games, but then you got more intentional about creating games that actually pulled things out of people. I'm just curious, what did you see happen with people? Mostly, I noticed when we would talk to them, there was always a wall. Hmm. There was always a defensiveness. There was always a loyalty issue that would come up with the biological other parent that they felt they had to protect or whatever it may be. Hmm. Something would always create some caution. And I wanted to get rid of that wall. I wanted hmm. to break down that feeling of fear. And so the only way that I thought of doing it is take away the fear, take away, away the confrontation feeling and just have it be a open, mm. relaxed, relaxed mm. time. And by playing a game, they mostly didn't even realize they were sharing when they were sharing. Really? And so we could get nuggets that we never would have even dreamed of getting if we would have just sat down eye to eye. Like what? That's a very good question. Like a situation that would have happened the week before that we noticed there was some tension that would have came up. Hmm. And by playing a game, it would open our eyes to a hurt feeling instead of just an anger or frustration that came out of them. They were really hurt about either way something was said or way something was handled. Okay, so we've come full circle. So I'm, I'm putting myself in the shoes of a parent listening right now, or maybe even a step parent. And they're going, Okay, I can see how the game would help do that. By the way, I, one of your games is sort of like Jenga where you have yep. blocks and you build it up and yep. you pull out a block and yay, I, I didn't make it fall. And oh, by the way, there's a little, there's some words on the side and I now have to read the statement or question. Isn't it's that right? question, yep. And, yep. and I've got to answer it before the next person can go. Is that's how, that's, that's how it works. That's how it works. So all of a sudden now I'm talking about something going on in my world and my life. So somebody's listening right now and they're going, great, I play that game and all of a sudden my kid or stepkid says something about this hurt from last week. What do I do? We did a lot of apologizing. Hmm. We would, depending on if it was a very emotional answer, mm -hmm. we would maybe stop and we would talk about it for a little bit. And then we would apologize for whatever situation that that would have put them in unfairly. Hmm. A lot of times, I think, us as adults, we don't realize something we say or something we do could be so hurtful hmm. to our children because of their loyalty that they have to the other side. 
And so it makes you really step back, see things out of their eyes, and then you can deal with it that way. And if you go into it with a apologetic understanding attitude, the door is open for forgiveness and then healing happens. Would the apology in some cases come right then? Like even as you're playing the game? Yeah. You know, one of the things I love about this is the game is a diversion. Yep. You know, it's a very intense moment to be eye to eye, knee to knee with somebody and you apologize to them. Them, them share something and you go, oh, wow, I, I had no idea that I hurt you with that comment about your dad or whatever. And now I see it, now I hear it, and I'm now responding to it. It's sort of like, wow, that, that can be an awkwardly intense moment. That's what's kind of cool, though, because it is awkward, it is intense, and so a lot of us just then freeze, Yes. don't know what to do next, uh-huh. where it's an absolutely easy thing to say, okay, it's your turn. Yep. <laughs> and you just go right on. We're back to the game. Yep. And the game sort of gives us a structure. Yep in order to keep going and get past that awkward moment, but at least we had the moment, you dip into the intensity and then you pull right back out again. And I think that's really useful. So I'm wondering if you've got a particular instance that you can recall where something came out in the middle of a game. Well, for me, I think it was an awareness that it was easier for me to parent and love my kids. There was a time when I was trying to blend the family together, and yet I thought I was doing pretty good. But we were playing a game, and one of my stepchildren made a comment that, well, sure, her son gets more attention, gets seems to be the, the favorite child. And I had to stop and think and realize that frustration that she was feeling, as much as I didn't want that part of the family, I was the one responsible for putting it there. Mm -hmm. And so it was very eye-awakening for me so that I could stop and be a little bit more intentional on how I maybe voiced things, how I shared things, how I treated the kids, to make them all feel equal, make them all feel loved. And so we did stop. I did apologize and say I I didn't realize that it was coming out that way. I'll try to do better. Hmm. Well, first of all, I got to commend you for apologizing in that moment. And maybe you did feel a little defensive, uh, maybe not, but kind of just saying, I need to move toward this child in this moment. Because here's the thing, Krista, that I about that moment that I want other people listening to learn. And that's that when you hear criticism from somebody who's essentially saying, I don't feel as important to you as I wish I were, it's very easy to go into, well, you don't understand, uh, you know, this or that, or this is my child, you're not my child, you know, all of that sort of thing. And you miss, what you hear is the criticism. What you miss is the request. What you miss is the desire in that child to say, oh, you know, I really want more of you in my life. Right, right. And you didn't miss it. You moved toward that. The apology moved you And I didn't do it right all the time either. It's a very tough thing to do. You mm-hmm. have to take yourself out of the moment. Mm-hmm. And even that time when I appeared to reach out, you know, when I got back to the room and me and my husband had time alone and apart, don't think I didn't say, well, that was unfair. (laughs) (laughs) Because it it is a very unnatural and hard thing to do to put those biological feelings aside to accept something that doesn't feel normal at first. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a little bit of going back and forth and reminding each other and being willing to change. Do you know what you changed after that? I also didn't do it right every time after that, but I really tried to be intentional, Mm -hmm. and I really tried to involve all four in my conversations, not just my two. Hmm. Good for you. 
We've entitled this episode, It's All Fun and Games. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> and uh, of course, it is all fun and games until it's not. In other words, sometimes somebody gets angry, like we were talking about at the beginning. It, even playing with friends and family games bring out competition, and sometimes people get feelings hurt or they lose and they don't like to lose or whatever it is. So somebody listening to us right now is going, okay, I like this idea of your games. And of course, our show notes are going to tell people how they can look at the products that you have. But what if we start playing a game, somebody gets mad at somebody else? Like, we're already in a little tense place in our blended family, and the last thing we need is that. Uh, well, how would you coach somebody through that moment? What, what could they do? I wouldn't want to make them stuff their feelings, so I would hmm. table it. Hmm, table it. Yep, I would table the game. Okay. Table the game, and I would say, okay, let's go get some you know, bedtime snack, dessert, whatever it may be, to try to calm down the emotions and then go on with the night and just look at that time as being introspective for them, that yeah. they will leave and they'll be able to look at what triggered for them. Mm -hmm. um, the biological parent would go and spend some time with them before bed and just ask them some questions to see if they're doing all right, if they're feeling safe, if they're not safe, why aren't they safe? Mm. I would leave that to the biological parent to do on I some one-on-one like -on -one with them. I like that. So what I hear you saying is, okay, if something gets triggered in somebody and, okay, we can't go on with the game, we, it's okay. We don't have to finish the game. In a way, the game did its job. It showed us something here that needs attention the game's not going to solve it. We table the game. We find another way to sort of connect into the hurt or the pain or try to deal with that. And maybe having the biological parent, for example, go and spend some time with them. Yep. If the game gets to be something of them feeling cornered where they're going to get to places that they're going to be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. it doesn't serve its purpose. Hmm. It's hmm. got to be just something that they're having fun with before you're going to feel safe in order to open up. And so once you get to that point, it's time to just move on to something, something else. Earlier, you said in your own family's journey, it was tense the first few years. And so playing games didn't really fit. Can you think of another time when a family would choose not to pull out a game? Like I'm wondering about holidays or special days when there's naturally a little already so much yeah. chaos going on exactly yeah. stress and yeah. trying to figure out how to get the five grandparents over christmas and you know in some ways maybe that's not the time i don't know i would agree there is a lot of chaos there is a lot of tension always with that time and there's never enough time mm. to even have your own family dinners more or less bringing out a game You've been listening to my conversation with Krista Smith Larson. I'm Ron Deal, and this is Family Life Blended. We'll hear one last thought from Krista in just a minute. If you have a topic or question you'd like for us to address on a future podcast, you can submit it, blendedquestions at familylife.com, or you can leave us a voicemail if you'd rather do that. The show notes will tell you how. Here's a note that came in from Ashley. She says, when my husband's ex-wife moved away, it became difficult for him to balance work life and fatherhood for all four of their kids. His parents and sister stepped in to help, but according to my husband, they took it too far. His parents were making decisions for his kids behind his back, and his sisters started believing that they were the primary authority because my husband was at work. Well, this all affected his relationship with his kids, and they themselves started to believe that their aunties had dominion, she says, over them rather than their father, which developed this belief that their aunties loved them more than their father. How can my husband reset this idea for both his kids and his parents and siblings? He doesn't want to cut off the close relationships that his kids have developed with their grandparents and their aunties. So how does he navigate this? And then she added this, by the way, this also affects my ability to build a relationship with his kids. And I would say, well, absolutely. I'm sure that it does. Look, there's a lot going on here and it's a delicate situation. So let me just share some guiding principles that you and others might find helpful if they have a similar situation. First of all, let's thank God that his family stepped in. 
I mean, let's recognize they came in at a time of need and they took on responsibilities and they helped carry the load. And boy, we all need that at different points in our life. Second of all, let's use that gratitude as he begins to talk to them about making changes. He has got to talk to the aunties and the grandparents before he starts making changes with his children. Okay, now notice his approach. Start with gratitude. Thank you for all you've done. I just want you to know how much I appreciate what you've done for me over the years. And then second, he can turn the corner and say, I need to ask for your continued support, but in a very specific way. Now notice what he just did there. He's not saying, now stop being helpful. He is channeling their support and their help in a new direction. And now he can clarify that. He can say, the best way you can help my wife and I at this point, at this season of our life, now I need to ask for you to begin to do this. Now notice, he's not saying stop supporting us. He's not putting a halt to it. He's not saying back off. He's saying, this is how you can support me in this season of our life. He could say something like, the best way you can help my wife and I and the kids we're trying to adjust to a new blended family. We're trying to figure out how to be leaders in this new home that we have. So what I need you to do is to support my wife and I as we move forward with the kids. I need you to let me step into the role that I need to be as father. So would you like check with us before making some of those decisions? You've been doing a great job for a while. Would you just check with us before you keep making those decisions? Would you let us take the lead with the kids whenever we have the opportunity to do that? We, we need to step into that role. I'd appreciate if you'd let us do that. Would you pick them up a little less often, you know, you know, from here or there, soccer practice? All of those little examples get very practical about how they're going to channel their continued support and love for the children, grandchildren, and now for him and his new wife. Then you can add something at the end and maybe say, you know, I've lost a little ground with the kids and I need your support to get it back. Now, if that does not enlist their help in a new direction, then you may have to get more direct. In other words, time will tell whether they can uh, adapt to this and say, yes, okay, we'll move into that. Help us figure out what that looks like. If you've won them over, great, that's it, end of it, just go with it. But if they continue, to do the things that they were doing before and it continues to create problems, then the second conversation perhaps needs to be more direct. Something like, I know you think you're helping by taking over, but you're not helping. It's actually causing some conflict between the kids and I. So I need to ask you to please stop. And if you're not able to respect this request, and this is where you pray over what the next thing is. You know, you may have to say, um, we're going to limit the amount of time you have with the kids. Something, you know, I'm going to invite a pastor in to, to talk with all of us and help us figure out how we can get on a better track here. If that's the part that you have to pray over and decide what you think you can support and live up to, but notice the approach, you get direct only if they prove to be unwilling to adapt into what you're asking them to do. We certainly don't want it to get more direct unless it has to, but sometimes that's exactly what's required. Okay, last thought. I suspect that this enmeshed or the aunties take control sort of family dynamic is not new. I suspect that maybe this pre-existed the need for their support. And if that's true, you're going to have a much harder time, Ashley, creating change because it's built into the fabric of this intergenerational family. In that case, get some outside support and guidance, maybe a pastor, maybe a family therapist. You got to find somebody who can help. By the way, we have a list of coaches and therapists that have gone through my Step Family Therapy provider training. You can find that at smartstepfamilies.com. My guess is one of those persons would be more than happy to coach and help you through this difficult situation. Well, Ashley, I hope that was helpful to you and to others listening. Again, if you have a question, I'd love to hear it. The show notes will tell you how you can submit it, and we'll try to answer it on a future episode. 
If you'd like more information about my guests, you'll find it in our show notes, or you can check it out on the Family Life Blended podcast page. That's familylife.com slash blended podcast. And while you're there, you might as well check out everything Family Life has for your marriage and family. Our division is Family Life Blended, and we have the world's largest collection of online articles, videos, resources, and books for blended families, including my book and my video series, The Smart Step Family, and the booklet that we have for children ages 10 and up called Life in a Blender. Check us out. The show notes will tell you how. And don't forget to leave us a rating or a review if you have a couple of minutes. That helps other people find us, and you can share this on social media. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, boy, we would love for you to do that. That way you won't miss any future episodes. You can do that on our own Family Life app or go through your podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify. You can even watch us on YouTube. Hey, we know that small groups for blended families and pre-step family counseling really works, which is why Family Life Blended is doing more to train local leaders in blended family ministry. We've got an online course that you can do at your own pace. It's called the Certificate in Blended Family Ministry. And each fall, we sponsor a two-day in-person conference called the Summit on Step Family Ministry, where we bring together leaders and experts from various disciplines and church leaders. So you can network with one another, learn the latest strategies, find the latest resources. It's the premier ministry training event in the country. This year, we're going to be in Phoenix, October 13 and 14, 2022. We've got a new theme. We've got new speakers, new opportunities for you and your church to join with those who cannot turn away from this group of people who need ministry. So let me just remind you, this is an in-person event only. It is not live stream. So get it on your calendar and make plans to join us. Visit summitonstepfamilies.com for all the details. That's summitonstepfamilies.com. Now here's that final word from Krista Smith Larson. You have to be somewhat open. You don't want to throw a game in a tight schedule to where it's already mm-hmm. chaos because then you're just adding more chaos. It works out well to have a determined family night so that everybody knows the games are coming. Mm. You do it, um, you know, Sometimes with blended families, you can't do it weekly. And so you decide to do it once a month or you just have a family night that people are, they learn to expect it Mm -hmm. and you make time for it because it's on your calendar Mm -hmm. and you become more accustomed to it that way instead of making them feel like, all right, it's time to talk and time to share. Tell us a little bit about your two favorite games before we close. I would say I have a new one called two by two and that's a matching game and it works really really well um you have 72 different relationships possible relationships so it could be with the stepmom it could be with the step grandparents and as soon as they match two cards of what that relationship is it's like a cartoon figure on there they talk about how they can improve that relationship hmm. Hmm. and so you're hitting some relationships you maybe wouldn't talk about normally, but you're also trying to get them to think about how that relationship can be improved. Hmm. So I like that one because it has an opportunity to go beyond the immediate family as well. Hmm. Another one would be simply the double trouble, mostly because it's a quick one that a lot of times when the kids come home from school, there's not time to do a game or you're waiting to pick up another child at a school thing and they're in the car with you that these double trouble dice are just simple you got a situation on one dice and a second dice you have people and you would you just have them roll the dice Hmm. and you say when you're with your stepmom what makes you feel happy Hmm. when you're with your friends what makes you feel anxious and it was it's just a really quick way when you ask them how was your day at school, sometimes they look at you and say fine. Yes. And it's a way to go a little bit further mm. to see what's going on on the inside. Mm-hmm. Man, I, I love this. I've done a little bit of play therapy with kids in the past and worked with some children who have been through trauma. And we find that, you know, play therapy strategies are a great indirect way of 
helping them to relax and helping them to begin to give voice to things that are inside that they just don't know how to use words for. Yep. But the game allows them to figure out another way to bring that out. And it helps the, the parents to be able to listen. Mm. A lot of times we don't listen. Yeah. A lot of times we assume. I was very guilty of that. Mm. A lot of times we get jealous and so you don't step back and listen then either. So it really forces the parent and gives them an opportunity to listen to their heart. And we need to hear their heart more than we see and hear their actions. Next time, we're going to hear from veteran blended family educator and therapist Gil Stewart, who's going to tell us about his new resource for stepdads. For me to be on purpose, uh, humbling myself until that other person feels heard could be a game changer. That's my friend Gil Stewart next time on Family Life Blended. I'm Ron Deal. Thanks for listening. And thank you to our monthly donors who make this podcast possible. If you'd like to say thank you for what the podcast offers you, just look in the show notes for a link. We appreciate it. Every dollar counts. Our producer is Marcus Holt, mastering engineer Jarrett Roski, project coordinator Ann Ancaro, and theme music composed and performed by Braden Deal. Family Life Blended is part of the Family Life Podcast Network, helping you pursue the relationships that matter most.